messages on the electronic church. Oh, boy. <laughs> and we'll entitle tonight's message, Primetime Gospel. <laughs> like traveling salesmen, your TV and radio preachers are always badgering you to try to get something out of you. And it's uh, an upstart movement that's been going on, to be real precise, 77 years now since the first Christian radio program, but there's never been a time in prime time religion like today. Everywhere you turn, turn on the station, you're finding prime time gospel in an Americanized package and form. They'll tell you how to get your needs met real quickly, touching the radio, touching the TV, as long as you'll send them in a little donation for their false ministry. But it was on December the 24th, the night of December the 24th, 1906, that the first wireless voice broadcast to the public was made. It was heard by some ships with wireless radios off the coast of the state of Massachusetts. And of all things, it was a woman. Do we have a hint there of women preachers? It was a woman reading the Gospel of Luke. First radio, first public wireless radio program broadcast in history, and it happened to be a Christian radio program. And then there was some song, Christian song that came afterwards. But the very first wireless broadcast that was picked up by someone in the public, picked up by some ships in the North Atlantic, was a woman reading the Gospel of Luke, and there we began what we call today, what's been called by the secular news media and secular critics, the electronic church. No longer is there that primitive, life-giving, love-flowing Book of Acts type of church, but it's all done by means of computers and satellites today. And so I've got some things to share with you that are quite interesting about the church. Here's a report that came out that is quoting those that are in the electronic church. Now, if you've got a TV and 98% of the homes in this country have one, if you've got a TV, you know what the electronic church is. Or if you've got a radio, I guess 100% of people have radios. Those that don't have TV certainly have radios in this country. Then you know something about the electronic church. And it seems like hardly anyone besides the secular news media and secular critics are even questioning the validity and the scripturalness of the electronic church. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have the option of believing what they say or not believing what they say? Is it something as, as scriptural as most people are making it out to be? Obviously, we can't use the excuse, well, you can't find that in the Bible like we normally do because you can't find lights like we're using in the Bible. They didn't have electricity back then. They didn't have it tapped so that man could use it. Electricity's always been here, but they weren't using it like we use it today. So we can't use that argument, but there are many other things that we can use. But here's a report that came out in a favorable <laughs> journal, as a matter of fact, written, I believe, by an author that wasn't favorable to the electronic church, and it lists some of the claims made by some of these TV preachers and goes on to show how exaggerated all of them are, without exception. Uh, here's one of them. It says uh, Jim Baker, in his PTL club, claims 20 million listeners per week into his program. Uh, Jerry Falwell claims 15 million. James Robinson claims 50 million. Rex Humbard, granddaddy of them all, and this is a quote, up to 100 million listeners. I guess you see that's almost half of the country. He says is listening to his broadcast each week. A hundred million people. We've only got 230 million people in the country. That's almost half. I know I didn't listen to it. Anyone here listen to him lately? <laughs> well, there's a big uh, percentage knocked out right away from his hundred million that listen to his program each week. And so people have been doing a little study into these, these charlatans that come on claiming that people, a hundred million people are listening to them. Uh, you see, that sounds good to someone who's tuned in for the first time. He thinks, well, there's a hundred other, other million people besides myself listening to this fellow. He must not be too bad after all then. 
20 million listening to Jim Baker, 15 million, Old Time Gospel Hour, Jerry Falwell, 15 million, 50 million, James Robinson, and a whole lot of the other ones claiming multiplied millions that are listening to them. And so some of the people in the secular press have done some studies and found the following. Only two, two I didn't even happen to mention them, only two of the big time, prime time religion TV preachers have an audience of over two million viewers per week. Or Roberts, and Robert Schuler. Schuler, I think, is the very tops, and I think all Roberts fi falls behind. These are the only two that attract as many as 2% of the viewer households in the areas where their programs are broadcast. And for both of them, it translates into just about uh, 2 million viewers per week. Now, 2 million viewers is a long way from 100 million viewers that you are claiming have been listening to your program in the past. Uh, here's another report that came out. Back in 1972, there was only one Christian television station in the whole United States, owned and run by Pat Robertson, 1972. Just a little over a decade ago, there was only one Christian television station. Today, there are over 65. Again, in 1972, half of them were evangelical. There were some others that were liberal and a lot of other things, but half of them, evangelical, now 95% of them are these, you know, evangelical fundamentalist people that get on there and just about go wild on the television screen uh, trying to get you to give them some money. 1980, Jerry Falwell boasted publicly that he had 25 million people that watched his old-time gospel hour every week. The writer of the report here, this is another claim of his, up from the 15 million. Now he's claiming 25 million people watched his old-time gospel hour. The writer says this is an estimate that is larger than the audience for all religious programs combined every week, and he claimed that he was above all of them. He said that's not even, said that's a higher figure than all of them put together. And he goes on to say, later on, Falwell admitted to speaking ministerially whenever he said that. In other words, lying whenever he said that. That here's someone who does preach to millions of people. Not 25 million per week, not 15 million per week. It's very interesting. The reports that have been done by some of the ratings groups have shown they have a very, very small percentage of the people watching their programs. And the people that watch one program watch the others. So generally the way you get your figures too high is you counted one person twice. He is a typical religious viewer, but he watches all the programs. And therefore to count him for every program, you end up with too many people. Out of the around 230 million people, about 10 million of them are regular religious watchers of some TV program, religious television program. 10 million out of 230 million is again a very, very small number. Now, we've got people on TV that are telling us we can get our souls saved if we do what they instruct us and then claim they've got 25 million people and admit next week they were speaking ministerially, in other words, lying. That's just another way of saying you lied, to speak ministerially. You know, it's like the evangelist that claims he had 3,000 at the meeting when he only had 1,000 at the meeting. And he justifies that by saying, I was speaking ministerially. In other words, I was speaking as ministers speak. And what a reflection on the ministry and on Christianity to say, I was speaking ministerially. I speak like all ministers. We're all liars. Uh, we all claim more than really there. We all say we got more people saved and full of the Spirit and healed than we really did. We all say we've got more people watching our religious program. So then it becomes acceptable to speak ministerially claiming 25 million people. Yates goes on to say Roberts is the biggest, or Schuler is the biggest, Roberts comes behind, and Rex Humbard follows. Goes on to point out that over the last few years, we can say thankfully that some of them have been losing a lot of their people. Since 1977, one of the ministries, the Roberts Association, has lost 40%, almost half, of its audience. 
between 1977 and uh, the early 1980s. Of course, a lot of them are becoming worried now because in 72, there was only one station. Now there are stations everywhere, and it's getting a little difficult to keep pulling in the money and to keep your fans loyal to you since so many other people. Preaching may be a little better type of gospel, more entertainment on that particular network than yours are attracting some of your people, uh, such as one of the satellite networks over on the East Coast. Um, says, like other religious broadcast entities, this group has found itself preaching primarily to already converted people, drawing just 2 or 3% of total television viewing audience. The answer to not being able to fulfill the Great Commission in preaching to the lost is to replace pulpits and King James English with Johnny Carson-style sofas and soap opera vernacular. Amen. And so its anchor show, the Whatever Club, assumed an upbeat magazine format, complete with news spots from Washington. Other programs resemble familiar TV guide lineups with top quality soap opera, early morning news and chatter, miniseries on pornography, Wall Street analyses, and entertainment for the children. In other words, they've gone down from what they used to do, come on and preach some form of the gospel, to now many times turning on and there's no gospel on. Right. There's like uh, this one article saying a new soap opera that's trying to compete with the secular soap operas that is on a religious program now. And uh, very little Christianity will be seen in it. One of the employees, they said in early November, this soap opera featured a miraculous healing. And one employee says, leaving thus no doubt about where we stand. Well, oh, some plus for you that on one program you gave a miraculous healing and that's supposed to testify to Isaiah 53 and all the promises on divine healing. I don't know if you've seen it. I've watched an episode of it or two and it is blasphemy for a thing like that to be on TV and claiming to be a Christian soap opera. But you see, they're not attracting the people they want to attract. Of course, it costs so much. They have a 20-something million dollar complex, and so in order to uh, keep up with financial pressures, this network has gone to selling commercial airtime to the makers of Vicks NyQuil and Oil of, Oil of Olay. <laughs> Religious broadcasters who previously had been able to receive free time on this satellite through this network now are charged three thousand dollars per half hour causing many of them to cancel and look elsewhere for an outlet you see here's a christian satellite network rather than giving free time like it always did in the past to other christian groups it's got to get some money in so it kicks the christians out and lets uh, general mills and Kraft and richardson vicks come in and pay those prices that they can afford to pay to get on uh, their satellite network and get some airtime, And all the other Christians go out. There's fierce competition among these groups, although it doesn't seem like that on the outside. There have been some repercussions because these fans miss pulpit pounding and Bible reading. A large group of people are wondering, I'm glad it's a large group. I would estimate it's a very small group. A large group of people are wondering if they've not forsaken their mission. One uh, network director for this satellite network says, no, we've not forsaken our mission, we've just refined it. Last year, this is the president of the association, last year he boasted we had 75,000 people except the Lord. And that cost untold millions of dollars in production costs to get 75,000 people and you know as well as I do, half of them never got converted, and half of the half won't stay converted that did get converted, and that leaves you with practically none, and let's assume all of them got converted. 75,000, there have been services overseas where one charismatic evangelist with one message has seen more people converted than that, and all it cost him was the airfare over to Africa or wherever and renting some sound equipment, a PA system, so you can get it out to the masses there, and it might have cost you $10,000. And you saw 75,000 people saved. 
And here, their studios are something like $22 million just for the studios where they film all this stuff. And that doesn't count uh, $115,000 a month just for the satellite that they have. It doesn't count all of the other uh, systems they have set up and programs everywhere. And they think that they got 75,000 people to accept the Lord last year. Charismatic evangelists could have seen all that in one service. You get him in the right place with the anointing and he could have seen that many people saved with one message. And they're expecting us to believe that God is in this and behind this. God is a lot smarter than that. And he certainly doesn't waste money like that. All the money that goes into this television is the most expensive thing you can get involved in. It's much more expensive than radio or printing up tracks or going there in person and preaching. Television is the most expensive thing. And it is a tremendous financial drain on the churches here in this country to be expected to have to support something like this when they can't even support their own congregation. Some of them don't want to, of course. They like to stay home and support these. That is a tremendous financial drain. And therefore, the church in this country has to go to other programs. And the programs have increased in the last 77 years so that they can raise money locally because their people in their church are sending money to these satellite networks and all of these TV evangelists that are always coming on. So it's a very large uh, financial, tremendous financial drain on churches in this country. Here they say in two weeks and one month, we had close to 4,000 decisions for Christ measured by call-ins to 10,000 whatever club members or counselors in 83 cities. Now here you've got 4,000 decisions. We don't know what type of decisions they were, but there were 4,000 of them, and it took 10,000 counselors to record those 4,000 decisions. Two counselors per person. That's not New Testament. New Testament, one man went out and he saw hundreds saved. Or let's just say one went out and he saw ten saved. According to them, you've got to have two people going out for every one person you're going to get saved. Now that is miserable failure. Amen. And they had counselors set up in 83 cities, 100 cities. Now how much did that cost? All those places they were. Of course, these are volunteers. You don't pay them. But all these 1-800 lines, you better believe you pay for those. And these rooms where you meet, you pay for those rooms, wherever that is. And you have a whole bank of telephones, and maybe 30 telephones there. And all of them are these 1-800 numbers. Watts, Watts numbers are expensive to get. And even if they're not the 1-800, just all the phone connections there. Phone company won't let you have them all for the price of one there. <laughs> it's going to get as much out of you as they can. We hope they just get enough to drown all these people. <laughs> Says the challenge before this network is to develop a mix of programs appealing to a diversity of viewers without diluting the salt of the gospel message. You've already diluted it when you even think a thought like that. Thinking, how can I present this to a diverse group of people and not turn them off? You've already diluted it as soon as you thought the thought. Because you don't find them diluting it in the Bible. While they are not on the verge of sacrificing spiritual truth at the altar of Nielsen ratings, the pressure of competition is on the rise. It is, because you've got a limited number of people. There's about 10 to 15 million. A limited number of people out there. You've got to get them to watch your TV program and support your program. Now, that's difficult to do. You see, whenever they claim these 100 million, that sounds good to everyone, or 20 million, or 50 million. But when we find out that none of them, except two of them, even gain 2% of the viewing audience in the area where their show is broadcast, that's miserable failure right away. You ought to quit. If you only get 2% of the people, that ought to be a sign from heaven or the devil or someone to quit right now. But they don't. They just press on. But there is a limited number of people. Therefore, there is a finite pool of financial resources. And I believe that they're getting to the level of tapping that to an extreme right now. You can only go so far. With 10 million people, they only have so much to give. I don't care if you have a 15-a-month club or a 5-a-month club. <laughs> 10 million people only have so much to give per month. And as more programs come up and as you begin to expand, none of them want to cut back. They're all talking about building bigger and better things and expanding overseas and doing this. 
In other words, they are counting on a continual increase in viewer participation, and that's not happening. We just showed you with Oral Roberts' ministry, 40% decline between 1977 and around 1981. And so, in other words, they're in for just a whole lot of trouble. If they are expecting viewer participation to increase at the same rate the plans in their mind are increasing, and they're increasing fast. They lie in, at, at uh, <coughs> home in bed thinking about new things to do and better ways to get their programs out to people. And people simply aren't responding because there are a limited number of people to respond. One of the shows has, a, they say here, a former black Muslim third degree belt and karate holder who is on the show now who can't ever seem to get anything out straight as far as I'm concerned. He's always stumbling over his words and that would turn me off. I was wanting to get saved anyway. The other fellow, the chief in the program, whenever he signs off, says goodbye, I forget what his little phrase is, he always closes his eyes. And the other one, he's a lot more peppy than that. He and his wife will blow you a kiss if you don't watch out. <laughs> <laughs> then I guess the latest thing that has come out now over the last few years is uh, like this uh, bald-headed preacher. Uh, your, desti your destiny could be in satellite. He says, God spoke to me and said that my destiny was in the sky. <laughs> We could wish they'd build some rockets and send some of these people into outer space. He says his destiny is in the sky. I wish he'd go preach to the Martians. To help fulfill this, I'm presenting Bible college level teaching on Monday nights. There will be four one-half-hour lessons each Monday night, and I'll send you a certificate of completion. <laughs> Uh, that can be transferred to other Bible schools as soon as you complete the course. Pastors have indicated to me that this type of supplemental teaching is vital and necessary to the body. Hundreds of our smaller churches need outside ministry to support their local program. I wonder why. You ought to fire the pastor if he needs outside help to support his program. Their argument is, let's bring in the five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You can't get them in your average local church, but we can bring them to you by means of primetime gospel. We can send them in by means of satellite. Most of these people that they're claiming to be apostles and prophets aren't anything near being either one of those. The Lord's also directed me to put my Sunday morning Bible class on satellite for distribution. Uh, this will cause congregations to grow and be a source, so forth. You know, this is just one of many. It just seems like every one of them now has come out with some type of satellite program because they know they're going to be outdone unless they keep up with others and get on this satellite thing. Here's another one. It says, every church needs a video school. <coughs> Here's a, a husband and wife team. It says, every church needs a video school. God has placed in the hearts of believers a new desire for his word. Uh, we're going to help fulfill this with our video school of ministry. Ask your church. So here are the two questions I'm supposed to ask you. Do you want to love God more than you do? Do you really want to know more about God? All right. Uh, interpret amen as yes. If the answer is yes, then start a video school. <laughs> do you want to love God more and know more about God? Well, what fool doesn't want both of those things? What Christian doesn't want both of those? What type of proof is that for a... Well, if the answer is yes, then start your own church video school then. You can have a professional video school with the finest teachers of this age. Simply call us without obligation. But see, you'll be on their mailing list, though, if you call them. Here's probably the biggest one. They send a whole little magazine out about uh, their school that they've started up. Uh, something here from the director of the school. He says in 1979, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Can you believe he's claiming such a big theological term like that? By inspiration, we began, a, we began videotaping all of the classes here in our video cassette Bible school. He says, as director of this leadership and Bible institute, I'm determined to follow the biblical example. Now, here's the biblical example. In Acts 
19 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul met regularly with the disciples for the space of two years. And that's what we say. He met with them. He didn't beam his face, his shining face in there on some TV screen. He met with them regularly. And he says, I'm going to follow the biblical example and do what Paul did and meet with you regularly two years. You know, they got a two-year Bible school. They love to find proof text that God must shed tears in heaven, not crocodile tears, I mean genuine, over people that are as ignorant and as foolish as men like this. To go to Acts 19, that is perverting the word of God. To go grab a passage that says Paul met two years, and that's a justification for a two-year Bible school so you can meet regularly with them. The objective of spiritual maturity, uh, we do our utmost to maximize the spirit content of the program. This means teaching the Word of God uh, through experienced anointed teachers in God's greenhouse of love and mercy and unity. Now God's given us further direction at Leadership Bible Institute, a new program and a new name, reflecting a totally new vision for training laymen and laywomen and ministers for leadership in the outpouring of His Spirit and power in our generation. Now here's a whole little magazine given to that one thing starts off by quoting a passage that the heaven shall declare the glory of God. And so they say, see, now that means satellites will be in outer space and men's voices will be declaring God's glory. The other scripture they quote is Isaiah 40 and verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. In other words, the satellites up there for all of us to see and participate in. You know, you shouldn't have to say anything about this, but here are people that are grown men, and they don't even know anything about the Bible. By using a passage like that, an end-time prophecy, and it's going to be fulfilled that all flesh is going to see God's glory, he's not talking about satellites there. I mean, if you genuinely and honestly believe that, you're mixed up. If you honestly believe that the passages in the Bible that speak of the glory of God being revealed from heaven have anything at all to do with satellite network, you have a problem. You don't know the Word of God. These men don't know the Word of God. When you use Acts 19.10 as a justification for your satellite or TV or radio or whatever programs, you don't know the Word of God. And so we certainly can't expect you to be one who's going to teach us the Word of God whenever you get on your religious program. There are just a whole lot of things that... Uh, are wrong with these type of ministries. One of the most obvious things are the tricks and the treats that are childish garbage that they offer. They call them their premiums that they'll give you. And do you realize there are 60 and 70 year old men and women that wouldn't fail to send in their little monthly pledge to get some little childish treat that you get, you know, like what you used to get in Post Raisin brand or something, a premium that they would offer. <laughs> And you get that for only a dollar and a half for the box of cereal. And these things are requiring ten, fifteen dollars a month. Some of them have thousand member clubs or twenty five hundred member clubs. One of them calls itself uh, seven hundred club. Now, isn't that neat? We're supposed to all think that you know seven hundred members. Well, that was the way it started. They have two hundred eighty five thousand members that support that religious program, fifteen dollars a month and yet still continue to call, call it 700 Club. They got it started by 700, 700 people contributing $10 per month. Now you ought to call it the 285,000 member club. Then that would let us know that you don't need our help. You've got over a quarter of a million people sending you $15 a month for you to continue your program. Now tonight we're just going to get into the subject. We're going to get into a more important aspect of it next week, but uh, some of the things that are on the surface, like these gimmicks that they offer and the financial drain that they put upon the church, ought to point right away to the fact that these things are simply unscriptural. The personal promises that they give concerning praying for your needs, studying, reading your letters, and then writing you a letter back are dishonesty and fraud. And the government ought to and ought to be able to step in on some of these ministries and prosecute for fraud and dishonesty when they make the public claims that they're going to read your letter, pray for you, 
and then writes you back. All of them talk about, and here is, here's someone who lives in a guarded castle, and he says, write me. I'm looking for your letter today. Now, you easily could say, write us. We are looking for your letter today. It's interesting, if you read the book of 2 Corinthians, that in the latter part of that book, when Paul himself is speaking just from himself to others, he uses the only polite pronoun you could rather than I, he always says we. In other words, it's an editorial use of the word we, but it shows politeness and humility. If you always say I, I, or me, or mine, that doesn't look so good. And so what I'm saying is Paul, even though he was talking just about himself out of politeness, would say, you know, we are us, you know, we are doing this. And he doesn't mean we. For the continuation of this even though he was talking just about himself out of politeness would say you know we are us you know we are doing this and he doesn't mean we he means myself I mine it's mine it's not anyone else's even though he's talking just about himself but yet these men when they aren't talking about themselves but talking about their huge staff they hire instead of saying we say I just backwards from what Paul would do and so impolite and so dishonest and so rude that it's beyond Christian imagination that they would say things like that. I'm looking for your letter this week. Don't put it off. Write today. I'll pray with you. We want to pray with you. I'll pray over your letter. And I'll be sure to write you back. There are some of them that promise to do those things. Yeah. Now, to sum up what's wrong with that, these ministers are simply building these huge monetary structural empires to satisfy their own ego and their own pride and their own vanity. Now, that may be hard line, but it's also the bottom line. That I don't believe that if you're an overcoming Christian, you can be convinced of anything else outside of the fact that these that are in these big type of TV satellite programs are there for their own pride and for their own ego and vanity. If not, why are they getting involved in so many things besides just preaching the gospel? Amen. They're building huge buildings, you know, with their names attached to them. Amen. They're wanting their influence to grow and grow and grow. Now, I don't see any way you can get out of it but by saying that they're doing that for their own ego. And it's a shame that we have people posing to be Christians, counterfeit Christians, doing this all in the name of the gospel, the name of Christ and the name of the Bible. Uh, some people would say, well, I believe that, you know, these people are honest and they're sincere. Maybe some of your smaller ones are, but not your large ones, because they never stop growing. They never stop that desire to grow. And you see, as soon as someone says, well, they're trying to get people saved, I'll say you're blind. You're not even watching the programs that you're watching in the morning. They are not trying to get people saved. You don't get people saved with all of these programs that they have. It is nothing but a boosting of their own pride, ego, and vanity. And they're going to have to stand before the Lord and answer for this. I wonder if you'll turn over to Mark chapter 13. Their claim is that all that they have done, the electronic church, is on the premise of using it for a tool of evangelism. Uh, one of these leaders, one of the top leaders in the electronic church, uh, I read a book about him by someone else who had been a part of his ministry, and you would just be surprised. And I mean, I mean that literally. You would be surprised, even if a portion of these things were true, are written about this man, $500 suits, drives a $25,000 car that he trades in for a new one every six months, lives in a, an expensive home in Oklahoma and has a million-dollar mansion in Bel Air, owns a private jet, member of a country club that he paid $20,000 to join. His son also paid $20,000 to join. Now it costs $25,000. He is the head, or on the board at least, of many different corporations. His association owns a whole lot of secular associations. 
He was the same one who claimed a couple of years ago in uh, around December of one year, toward the end of the year, to have had a vision of a 700-foot-tall Jesus that told him to build a hospital with 777 rooms, real mystical in his numerals, you know. And it's been proven that Jesus never appeared to him in the first place. That wasn't what gave him the idea. He was sitting down, and it's been, it's been recorded publicly, that he was sitting down a year before that talking with some of his advisors on the idea of let's build a new hospital, and how do you think is the best way to raise money for that? Now, you see, whether you believe that or not about these men, I'm here to tell you these things actually happen. These men are frauds, dishonest men. They're not Christians. When he came out publicly and claimed 700-foot vision of Jesus, telling him to build a hospital, that was simply a public gimmick to get money for the hospital. He had already talked publicly to others about what can we do to get people to give and support. And he's actually been quoted as saying, we've got to find a new way to fleece the wool on these people. He said, I'm going to have to increase my, my methods of getting money. We're going to have to find a better way to fleece their wool. And people sit back, and then whenever I preach a message like this, oh, you shouldn't say that about them. These are lost men. Amen. And that's just one thing. You would not believe what goes on in these people's lives. And there's the number one problem when they're a thousand miles away from you beaming their happy, smiling, make-up face with makeup over the television screen. You don't know anything about that man. Amen. You know nothing about that person. Another quote I can't even give you. I couldn't even spell the word. I couldn't even give you a word that would rhyme with it. That's how filthy of vulgar language one of them used accusing someone else of doing something wrong. Called him a name. Uh, it's the worst curse word you could think of. Well, problem, don't even try. It's not even one of those that you want to think of. And he calls someone else that. And uh, these people sport around. The people here at this particular institution that he's built, uh, they drink their beer and smoke their cigarettes, although that's not allowed to the students there. The faculty does that. They swear. Uh, even the founders there have been caught doing these things in public. But you see, that just doesn't get back to the average 60-year-old woman back in New Jersey or something who supports the program. And even if the secular media does happen to pick it up, everyone says, oh, we're not going to believe them. They're criticizing, you know, our favorite preacher. They're just trying to make him look bad. And so they don't believe anything that the secular media has written about that evangelist. And I'll tell you what I know I would be, and I know you would be totally shocked if you found out what they actually do during the day and, you know, how they live. And one of them said, we're going to find a better way to fleece their wool. And he's one of the leading TV personalities and has been for decades in this country. And he'll preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and pray in tongues right on the airwaves. And you think he's born again. But when someone leads a life like that, uh, he and his son, avid golfers, and just always can hardly stay off the, go the golf course, so their associates write about them, and they paid almost $50,000 to join an elite country club together where they can go play golf all the time. You see, they have great prestige and power. Whenever you run an institution that's worth millions and millions of dollars like that, you have power with the bankers, insurance companies, investors, because you are a major attraction, especially the one I'm talking about now. In that whole part of the country, you're a major attraction. Now, you know, the Commerce Department of the state and everything, you don't want to bring the boom down too hard because... There goes all the millions of dollars spent by people that come into a place like this just to visit the Christian Disneyland that they built there. And some of the other ones are doing the same thing, but even better. To appeal not just to college students, but all ages. Preaching the gospel, using this as, an, as a tool of evangelism. No, you're building your own personal empire. And someone who doesn't see that is a fool and is blinded to the truth not to be able to see that and to continue to support these things they all want five or ten or fifteen dollars a month from you you're a faith partner of theirs so they would say and not to be able to see 
You see, the, the problem is, since you don't have that personal contact, you only see him whenever he comes on the screen. He's had his hair done by a professional. He has his clothes put on him and arranged by a professional. Uh, I trust all of you know this. He has makeup put on him by a professional. I don't have any makeup. I put my own clothes on before I came here tonight. They don't do things like that. You are all primmed and proper before you come out, and this is all your hairdresser and designer, and you wear designer clothes. It's all done by professional. And then you come on camera, and there you are smiling, just all ready to go. These people are demon-possessed because you never see them down at all. You know, even if they've had a terrible day, somehow they imagine they manage to come in looking like they just always have been on top. They've been out playing golf that day, drinking and swearing. And now they end up on television. And now they pray in tongues over national airways and everyone thinks that they're born again. Uh, that's just a few things I remember just from memory. I couldn't forget them after reading about one of these evangelists. And I hate to think what's true about the rest of them. But you can see their old, weak, shallow personalities. They can't be very much of a man at all. Not very much of uh, a minister at all. And yet they're wanting us to call them doctor, whatever. Here's one who doesn't have any earned degrees. Not one single earned degree. I don't even know if he's got a college education or a high school education. And yet he insists on being called doctor or president, depending on whether you go to his school or not. You see, that, that builds up your pride. You're a backwoods religious hillbilly and you want people to call you doctor or president. You never could make it. You're not bright enough to in the secular world except how to deceive people and raise money. And I'll tell you, that's a gift from Satan to be able to raise money like some of these people can. They couldn't make it out in the secular world. They get over into the religious world and start entertaining and having this whole host of millions of people following them. Even if it's not like what they claim, it's still millions of people that follow these individuals. Watch them on TV and just bow before these religious figures. Uh, over in Mark 13, we were turning to, uh, there are a couple of passages that I think are interesting to look at here because their claim, their justification for all of their fundraising techniques and their telethons, I listened to one of them the other day, and he's even willing to admit that telethons are a horrible thing. He says, we're now dragging them out over several months period. We don't want to have them all on one week because he said, they just about break you down. They're so terrible to do, but we got to do them anyway. We got to raise our bills. He even admits himself that they're things that shouldn't be done because no one likes them. He doesn't like to have to do them. No one else likes to have to listen to them. And so now he's a little more subtle by saying, now we're going to draw it out over several months and not just over a one week period. People can just turn their TV off for that whole week. But if it's on for several months, he'll catch you sooner or later. Reminding you about, well, we've got to have more money for fantasy land that we're building here, more money for upper room, prayer room, and all the other rides for the children and the goats and the animals for them to see. And what I was going to say is that they use this cry of evangelism, this, this uh, uh, claim of theirs that they're trying to get the world saved, they use that as a justification for their fundraising techniques. And our question is, is this really what they're trying to do? Over in Mark chapter 13 and verse 10, uh, I want to mention this before we go to a parallel passage because Mark translates the word a little differently than it's been translated in other gospels, and he generally has it this way, not just here in chapter 13 and verse 10, but in other passages. Verse 10, the gospel must first be published among all nations. The reason I use this to begin with is because many of those who send out printed material use Mark 13.10 and the word publish. You know what publish means according to what they are meaning by the word, that it means, you know, the printed word. Mark translates that word many times publish, but what else does publish mean? It means to vocally proclaim something. They didn't have printing presses back then. That wasn't invented for centuries, and of course that was not what he was talking about. I don't know how many times I've seen on a little track or a little book or a little newsletter a Mark 13.10 there, that this gospel must first be published. And so we're in the printing business. We're going to publish these things. Well, the word means vocal preaching or vocal publishing. 
not printed material to begin with. Uh, but then to go over to the more familiar passage in Matthew uh, chapter 24. Is this TV network, satellite program, really a tool of evangelism? In the first place, we could say, concerning that question, is it really a tool of evangelism since that's their primary justification for being on? You know, why are they there? Well, they'll tell you, we're here to do what Jesus said in the Great Commission and win the world. In the first place, most of those programs, I mean almost all of them, are produced and done right here in this country and are limited in their outreach right here to this country. And this country is already gospel-saturated. So to use tool of evangelism as your excuse for being on is really no excuse at all. This country's got plenty of the gospel. People in this country have heard the gospel. There's hardly anyone here above the age of a teenager who has not heard some form of the gospel at some time in their life. So to say it's a tool of evangelism, it's not evangelizing anyone. It's, mo for the most part, restricted right here to this country. This country has plenty of evangelism going on and for those countries outside of this country where you think well we're going to do what jesus said the great commission and go throughout the ends of the whole earth and preach the gospel they don't have tvs in those countries they don't have radios in those countries so whose wool are you trying to fleece whose eyes are you trying to cover up with the wool by saying you're going to get people saved in other countries they'll never see your religious program but your average listener never thinks of that. When they claim this as a missionary outreach, the vast majority of people in the world, 98% of homes in this country have TVs, but that is by far unusual and the exception. The vast majority of people on the globe today don't have TV sets. They'll never see your satellite program that you have beaming the gospel around the world. Just in a few isolated metropolitan cities can you even hope of having a TV set and hearing these programs. And that's where they're produced. They'll be in Hong Kong or uh, Johannesburg, South Africa or something like that. But what about the millions of square miles in Africa where there are no metropolitan centers and therefore there are no television sets? The only way you can get people saved is do what the Bible says and go ye to the ends of the world and preach the gospel. Not beam yourself there electronically, but go there. I don't know how many of them have claimed that, and I heard one of them say just last week, a uh, secular news analyst asked this religious broadcaster, do you believe that if Jesus Christ were here on the earth today, he would make use of television? He said, without a doubt, I believe that he would. Without a doubt, he believes Jesus would. But do you see, and they're claiming that God saw for the last days the rise of satellite networks and television, and he knew this would be the way that he'd get the world saved. You see, God's smart enough to know that that's not the way you're going to get the world saved because the world doesn't own television sets or radios. So what I'm saying is, that's a lame duck excuse. We're back to pride, ego, and vanity. The only, the only reason, and I'm sorry if that sounds too hard, the only reason they are there is because of their own pride and ego. That is the only reason. There's no secondary reason. The only reason is to build their own monetary and uh, secular religious empire and they're not there for any other purpose and so here in matthew 24 verse 14 we want to do a little looking here at a verse because it's one that they all use same as over in mark but it doesn't say publish the one over in mark is used by those that use the printed material and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. You can tell right away, this is a passage they grab and say, this is what God foresaw for the latter days, rise of satellites and TVs, radios, electricity. And he had preached the gospel to the whole world. For witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now I want to say several things, and I want you to remember this because you probably yourself have seen passages like this and wondered what actually is Jesus saying here? Or to say it another way, what does he mean when he says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations and then shall the end come? 
Without exception, that is what is used by those in radio, television, satellite as a justification for their very existence. Passages like this, along with Matthew 28, Mark 16, Great Commission. But it sums it up here in one verse very neatly for them, where you'll find several verses in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. So I want to say several things about this. In the first place, look at the very verse they quote. Generally, that's what the Bible does. It gives you the answer right in the text that the erroneous teacher is using. They use this. They're saying, it's our tool of evangelism, and we'll get the world saved, just as Jesus said. Well, he didn't say that that's the reason why you're to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. He didn't say to get people saved. He's not even talking about evangelism right here. He says this will be preached for a witness. Why? John chapter 12, so that the word can be used as a witness either for or against a person when the end shall come. Because he goes on to say, and then shall the end come. Never said anything about getting the world saved here. He said the gospel is going to be preached for a witness to all nations. Now, in the second place, he says that it's going to be preached in all the world, or as some of the other passages, like over in Luke or over in Mark, will say to all nations. And so they're trying very busily to get on uh, some type of program in every nation. So I wonder if you'll turn now over to Colossians chapter 1. Paul makes an interesting statement here that obviously is intended to be taken with a little reserve. Colossians 1 and verse 23. Because most people have wondered about verses like that and uh, have wondered, well, Perhaps are these people doing what they should be doing because it says that the gospel of the kingdom is to be preached in all nations. Colossians 1.23, Paul says, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, he's not talking about just some general aspect of God. He says the hope of the gospel, verse 23, which is Jesus Christ and salvation. You see, the whole world can see God's handiwork, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, but that's not saving knowledge. That's just general revelation and general knowledge about the existence of God, but not saving knowledge. Paul's talking about saving knowledge, the hope of the gospel. He says, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now, obviously, that's to be taken with reserve. It was not preached to every creature under heaven. Paul says this gospel is preached to every creature. They've just gotten the gospel. This is still first century. What about the people all the way on the other side of the globe? Have they heard the hope of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ? Obviously not. So when Paul makes a statement like that, you interpret it again in light of what the statement says, that it's impossible for every creature to have heard the saving message of Jesus Christ at this time. In other words, he just means a whole lot of people. And he's not speaking ministerially. He's speaking like many times when the Bible talks about all of this or every one of that or forever in this. And it doesn't literally mean all and everyone or forever. It might just mean sometime. It may just mean some people. A good example is what we've given you before in another connection back in the book of Genesis concerning the great famine that the patriarchs and their descendants experienced while in Palestine and therefore went down to Egypt during the days of Joseph to buy grain. And what does the writer tell us? So all nations came into Egypt to buy grain. Obviously, the North American Indians didn't go to Egypt to buy grain. It means a lot of people, a lot of them around in this area. And so it uses the word all. And that's certainly allowed as long as one understands the type of writing that's, that's taking place here in the Bible. And so this is what you have in Colossians. Not every creature has heard the gospel. 
Paul means a large number in this area have heard the gospel, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So when it talks about, what I'm saying is, when it talks about preaching the gospel to all nations, that just on the basis of this passage doesn't necessarily mean every single nation has to hear the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't mean that. I'm just saying on the basis of right here in Matthew 24 doesn't mean every nation. But we have to go a step further over to the book of Revelation in chapter 11. You see, the surprising fact is, and the only way you'll know this is to know the word of God, Matthew 24 and verse 14 is a verse that's found right in the middle of tribulation. Not talking about anything prior to the tribulation period. It's talking about the seven-year tribulation period. So you can't use a verse like that and say the gospel is to be preached to all nations because you're taking a, a verse out of context and people who don't study the word of God and therefore don't know Matthew 24 don't know that that is a verse that is spoken in reference to uh, not only Jesus' second coming but the whole tribulation period. Now, over in Revelation 11, we're not going to really get into these passages, but we're just going to give them to you. Uh, Revelation 11, verses 8 to 9, God's going to have two witnesses. And the whole world is going to hear of miraculous deeds just on the basis of these two witnesses. And then over in chapter 14, uh, verses, 16, uh, verses 6 and 7, we have another passage where the writer says, I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. This is, again, during tribulation. And to every nation. Now, when we read this text, evidently he means every single nation now. Every nation and every kindred and every tongue and every people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. How do you think God's going to get the message to every kindred, every tongue? He just told us an angel is going to come with the everlasting gospel and then the message is going to be preached. Now, there are some other things along with that we don't want to get into, but obviously he's not talking about radio preachers. Because over there in Matthew 24, that is a verse talking about the tribulation period. Now, who do you know knows that? No one that I know knows that. And they prove it by using the passage, saying this gospel must first be preached. That's right, but don't even think about it now because it's the wrong time if you're going to use that verse. That verse is going to be fulfilled, but it's going to be fulfilled during the tribulation. Now, that really puts a pin in the balloon of the electronic church and primetime gospel. But they don't know things like this. It's because they don't study the Word of God. And it doesn't matter to God or to me, or it shouldn't matter to you how many results they get. God will say, you did many wonderful works and you did them all in my name, but I never knew you. You may have gotten some bona fide results, Matthew 7, 20 and 21, but I never knew you. Just assume for a moment that some pagan person was beside Balaam whenever he said Numbers 23, 19 and got converted over to the religion of the Israelites. You think Balaam on Judgment Day is going to be able to say to God, well, I got a result. Someone believed Numbers 23, 19. Well, I believe Numbers 23, 19. I'm one of Balaam's results. That doesn't help Balaam any, though. Results that a person has, even if they're true and genuine, are not going to be your basis of entrance into the kingdom. And you're not going to be able to use that before the Father or the Son in Judgment Day and say, look at the results that we actually saw people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit and healed through this radio ministry. Maybe you did, but that's not going to help you because he's going to say, I don't know you because you didn't do it according to my will. You might have got something done, but whether you got it done or not, it's not what I'm after. I want to know whether or not you did my will. And so these that aren't doing his will and are doing their own, building their own empires, structural and monetary and otherwise empires, 
are going to have to answer to God on Judgment Day, especially for using, perverting, twisting out of context these passages by saying, let's go into all the world. If you're going to, you can't use, as we've shown you, Matthew 24, those type of verses. If you're going to use Matthew 28 and Mark 16, then you have to do what he said. And he said, go into all the world, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How can you lay hands on them? Well, they pervert that by telling us, now you lay hands on the television set. You lay hands on the radio, and you'll get healed. That's not what Jesus said. He said, you go into the world, and you lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You cast out demons, and the demons will go. If you're going to use a passage for your TV program, it'd have to be Matthew 28 and Mark 16. But then you would have to go yourself, and there goes your TV program. 